we don't know what Brexit means, but we do know that every conceivable option within a range of options that are on the table are going to be prejudicial to Scotland's economic interest and they are going to be contrary to Scottish public opinion. So therefore, we can see no other scenario but that there has to be a new referendum on Scottish independence and we need to start setting the timetable. That was the position in March. That was what Ruth Davidson fought the campaign upon. And the irony is this, that that position changed after the general election on June the 8th. But the reason why it changed was in itself because of the result of that election. You no longer had a majority, you no longer have a majority Tory government. You can no longer argue, I certainly can't argue, that the range of potential options, and again, we don't know what Brexit will look like, but the range of potential options exclude any possibility of us getting a deal that might be satisfactory in the short term, that might have different relationships for Scotland, that might have different powers for the Scottish government, that might go some way towards Scottish public opinion. I really don't know. But the fact is now, because we don't know, we do have to wait and see what the outcome of Brexit is before we can actually activate that mandate that we have from the 2016 election campaign. And the irony is this, that the Scottish Conservatives will claim this as a victory, the fact that we have pressed the pause button on a second referendum. But the reality is the reason why that has happened is not because the, the Conservatives won seats in Scotland, but it's because they lost seats in the rest of the United Kingdom and no longer have a majority in Parliament. The third factor that was at play on June the 8th was Brexit itself, which I say that and then I think about the campaign and it's really it's quite remarkable. An election that was called ostensibly because of Brexit actually never mentioned it during the campaign itself. But it, that, that didn't really matter because for the last two years we have talked about precious little else and clearly it had made, people had formed opinions about it. Now it's fair to say I think that the SNP was probably the most uh, unequivocal pro-EU party, pro-Remain party in the run-up to the Brexit debate. But of course there were many supporters, some members of the SNP, uh, who disagreed with that, who do not see the European so Union as something they want to be part of and want to support. And I believe that some of those people did not want to vote SNP on June the 8th because they did not want that vote to be taken as a mandate to challenge the Brexit decision that had been taken by the UK the, the year before because they, broadly speaking, agreed with that. They didn't vote for anyone else, by and large, but they simply stayed at home rather than have their vote misinterpreted. And I think, of course, the way in which the party presented the arguments for having a second independence referendum as being inherently linked to the outcome of Brexit conflated these two things in the public mind in a way in which they didn't need to be conflated. Now, there are good reasons for not liking the European Union and there are bad reasons for not liking the European Union. Good reasons might include the common fisheries policy, the restraints on national governments being able to borrow and invest in their own economy, and a, a lack of democratic accountability of the institutions to ordinary people. Bad reasons would be xenophobia and a general isolationist view and lack of will to cooperate with others. Myself, I am, I am very pro-European. I'm pro-EU. My position was remain and reform. I don't see it as the be-all and end-all. I don't see it as a perfect institution, but I see it as better than not having it. And if it wasn't there in the first place, I think we would by now wish to create it. And that's because I believe that you know, capitalist corporations that now control the global economy, it is better, I think, if national governments combine together to try and locate those corporations within a regulatory framework which limits their ability to exploit their workforce to rip off their customers, or indeed to harm the environment in which they are operating. Better to have that regulation than not to have it and to allow unfettered markets that allow corporations to do what they want. But that's a difficult and tricky argument to try and get across to people, and that reform in Remain point of view, frankly, wasn't even, didn't even get airtime during the Brexit debate and the, uh, the process leading up to the vote in June uh, 2016. But that, that would be my position. But I think the main position that we should adopt now, and I say this in terms of the wider movement that supports Scottish independence, because we, always, we always need to be concerned. The, the truth is now, I think, we are leaving the EU, and the debate about, you know, well, if Scotland became independent, 
it could just remain in the EU because it already was, or we could take, some people remember the argument, we could take over the membership card if the rest of the UK wants to leave and we want to stay. I think those are all gone now, to be honest. I think we're, we're leaving the EU, and the reality is that if an independent Scotland at some point in the future wanted to rejoin the EU, uh, it would have to negotiate its way in. And therefore, I think what we need to do now is we need to begin to develop a vision of what type of European Union we would like to be part of. We need to develop an agenda for change with other progressive parties across the European continent of how those institutions should change. And if and when we get the opportunity to do so, and I'll come to this in a moment, then a, an independent Scottish government should negotiate the best possible deal for Scotland within the EU, which may include full membership or which may not. It may be some hybrid solution. I, I wouldn't preempt the outcome, but it should negotiate from the point of view is of what is best for the people that live here. And when it's got the best deal it can, then it should put that to another referendum, a plebiscite of the people who live in Scotland, so that they can decide on their relationship as an independent country with the rest of the European continent. Because independence is about having the right to make your own decisions, whether that be what type of health service you want to have, or whether that be the relationship you have with other countries. And I think if we were to develop an argument in that way, then we can decouple the arguments for self-government from the arguments for the European Union, and we can allow people to support one without having to support the other, which is an important point we need to get to on our route to a majority. So we have the second referendum, we have the, the day job, and we have Brexit, and the fourth, the fourth factor that was at play in the general election was what you might call the Corbyn factor. And we might as well spend a couple of minutes discussing it. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, for all you can say about him, has, you know, he has taken the Labour Party in a different direction. And if you cast your mind back to the run-up to the 2015 general election, and indeed during the referendum campaign itself. The argument of me and people like me who were standing for the SNP or indeed for the Green Party or other pro-independence parties was that actually Labour had sold, sold the jerseys. We called them red Tories, not just because they associated them better together with the Conservatives throughout the referendum campaign, but because they supported Trident they supported more or less the Conservative government's or the coalition government's uh, austerity plans. They supported foreign interventions that we did not. So we gave them uh, this moniker, and it, and it resonated, and it stuck, in large part because it was true. But say what you want about Jeremy Corbyn. You can call him many things, but the moniker Red Tory doesn't really stick. And that meant that as he was being vilified by the Tory press for taking Labour in a certain direction, he gained a lot of sympathy. He gained sympathy from people who believe in the things that I believe in. And I know people. I mean, this had more of an effect in, in England, where he began to actually talk about people power and political engagement, political involvement, resonating many of the themes, I think, that were there in the independence campaign of 2014. Now, it had a bigger effect in England than here, but Scotland was not immune. And I know of people in my constituency who've come to me and they said, Tommy, we voted yes in 2014. We voted for you in 2015, but we felt we had to support Jeremy Corbyn because of what he's saying, because, you know, he's this radical. And Corbyn caught the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. He really did. And a very adept social media campaign, and again, borrowed some tricks from the Yes campaign, was very effective at promoting this. And I don't think our response to that was adequate. And I'll go on in a minute about what that response should be, but that is undoubtedly a fact that Jeremy Corbyn uh, had an effect. Now, there are many ironies that result from what happened. The, the first and obvious one is that um, the Scottish Labour leadership has spent the last two years trying to undermine Jeremy Corbyn, and you couldn't get two political institutions that are further apart than the opposition office in, in, uh, in, in, in Westminster and the headquarters of the Scottish Labour Party. But that seems to have dissipated now. I mean, I witnessed Ian Murray lead the standing ovation for Jeremy Corbyn when, um, when he came into the House of Commons after the election. So they're all Corbynites now, it would seem, or at least until, at least until something happens. 
<laughs> but, but another great irony is, of course, that when people did that and went out and voted Labour rather than SNP in seats which were marginal between the two, in some cases what they succeeded in doing was actually getting rid of left-wing SNP MPs like George Carafin or Anne McLaughlin, who were quite well disposed to Jeremy Corbyn, and replacing them with right-wing Labour MPs who very much are not and who will stoke up problems for them in the future. And I don't know how that's going to play out. But the biggest irony of all is this, that because, because the Labour vote churned so much in this election, and they undoubtedly lost votes to the Conservatives on what you might call their older right-wing vote, who were seduced by these arguments about the defending the union is more important than social and economic change, and perhaps they didn't really like Jeremy Corbyn anyway, and they went on Facebook so they couldn't get an alternative point of view. They lost votes in that direction, but they gained votes from people who would be, regard themselves as part of the, the, the Yes movement, uh, maybe voted SNP, maybe voted Green, maybe, voted some, maybe didn't vote, but, but now they came in and they voted uh, for Jeremy Corbyn. Because of that, because of that change, we now have a weird situation where actually the cohort of Labour voters in Scotland is now probably more well disposed to the concept of political independence for Scotland than it has ever been and is therefore more out of step with its leadership in Scotland than it has ever been. Now, an interesting thing to observe will be how the Scottish Labour leadership respond to that. But if they begin to allow discussion about the Constitution within the ranks of the Labour Party, if people who support independence in the Labour Party, and there are quite a few, are allowed to organise and promote their ideas, then I think we get into quite a, an interesting new situation. And I think the wider yes movement should keep a canny eye on that and be very supportive of those developments if it takes place. If that doesn't happen, then I think many of those people will quickly be disillusioned with where they placed their votes and come back. So what should the response, I asked this question to myself, not to you, what should our response to, to Corbyn's Labour Party be if, if, you're, if you were in my position? Well, I think the first thing to say is that um, we should work together where we can. There is no point in manufacturing political disagreement for the sake of it. And if in the House of Commons at Westminster the opportunity presents for Labour and the SNP and the other opposition parties to come together and maybe drag a couple of disaffected Tories with us and defeat the government in any particular policy, we should seize that opportunity. So we need to be prepared to do that and to work very effectively together. I think at local level too there is no reason why Labour councillors and SNP councillors cannot work together. It's interesting that here in this city, that despite the fact it took sort of several months of posturing and politicking because of other elections getting in the way, when the SNP and Labour groups did decide to form a coalition, it was actually a very simple process to put together a program for what they would do because to a very great extent their manifestos overlapped and they agreed on the political objectives. So where we can, we should probably be working with the Labour Party. I see no reason to be sectarian about this. But the second thing I think we need to do is we need to explain, particularly to those young voters who voted for Corbyn for the first time, the limitations of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, and they are legion. The first thing to say is that Corbyn is not a fan of constitutional or electoral reform, and the basic constitutional setup in this country is not going to change either in Scotland or in England if, we, uh, if, we, if, if he becomes Prime Minister and is a position to run the country. But the second thing to say is actually Jeremy Corbyn, despite his personal beliefs on the matter, has been unable to get his party to a position where they might ask for a review, never mind stepping back, from our expanding nuclear weapons program. Also, in terms of the welfare state, the Labour manifesto was far less radical in reversing the cuts to welfare and investing in public services than that was contained in the SNP manifesto. It really was. So in fact, what I'm saying to you is that Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party isn't half as radical as it thinks it is. But the other big argument against Jeremy Corbyn, I'm afraid, is that despite the fact that the Tory government was in chaos and imploding in the run-up to the election, despite the fact that they had this massive ferment across the country of support with new layers of people voting for the very first time, it would seem, and despite the fact of enormous goodwill 
from people who might have voted for the Liberal Democrats or indeed for the SNP or for Greens or other parties deciding to give Corbyn 